Welcome to week three of research methods. I'm Miss Vahib and today we're going to go over some things that can affect the accuracy and consistency of our results and then we'll look at some of the non-experimental research methods that I promised we'd go through this lesson. So the first thing we're going to look at is validity. So validity refers to whether or not a study, investigation or investigative tool is a legitimate or genuine measure. So basically, how accurate is the study or measure we are using in our study? So we need to know about two different types of validity. The first one is internal validity. And the second one is external validity. Internal validity concerns things that go on inside or within a study, such as did the IV affect the DV or did something else have an effect on the dependent variable? Was there another reason we got our results? Could it have been a confounding or extraneous variable? So we looked at those last lesson. Or could it have been demand characteristics or investigator effects that have affected our results? Demand characteristics are when a subject picks up cues during an experiment and modifies their behavior, thereby possibly affecting and altering the results of the study. So, for example, if we look at our participant here, he's worked out what the experiment or the true aim of the experiment is, and he has decided he thinks he knows how he, the experiment wants him to behave. So he's going to change his behavior to help him get the results or her get the results she needs. Or the participant could start thinking they understand the true aim of the study and they want to mess up the results. So they could screw over the results if they wanted to. So that is an example of how demand characteristics could work and how they could affect our results. Investigator effects are also something that can have an effect on our results. So an investigator effect is when the investigator directly or indirectly has an effect on a participant's performance other than what was intended. So if we have a look at our researcher or investigator here, um, she's thinking she'll be nice, super nice to control group one and will be very formal with group two. And as such, that can have an effect on the results that both of these groups produce. And therefore, that could have an effect on kind of the overall results. And that is an example of an investigator effect. Something else that can affect the internal validity of an experiment is whether the researcher tested what he or she intended to test. So, for example, if you wanted to find out whether watching TV affects the quality of homework, you cannot be certain you are testing watching TV just by having the TV on. The person may not actually be watching it. Something else that can affect the internal validity of an experiment is whether or not the study possessed mundane realism. So does the participants or does the task the participants were asked to do mirror the real world? So if I asked you to memorize three letter consonants in a freezing cold lab, that does not mirror real life. So essentially, that experiment would lack mundane realism. External validity concerns whether the results can be generalized. So it can, whether or not they can be generalized to a kind of different situations. So can they be generalized to other people? If they can be generalized to other people because you had quite a representative sample of the whole population, then it would have population validity. But if you used, for example, in your sample only um, 
for example, English students aged between 16 and 18, you couldn't necessarily generalise your findings to the whole of the world. Therefore, your particular study may lack population validity. Can your research or your results be generalised to other settings? So if you conduct a study in a lab, can your findings be generalised to the everyday lives of people, for example, in Peckham or in Cambridge University? A lot of the time, lab studies lack ecological validity as the findings cannot be generalised to other everyday settings. Can your results be generalised to other times? So if we were to do a study on attitudes towards sex in the 1950s, we may get a completely different set of results if we did it here in 2018. That means the study in the 1950s would not stand the test of time and therefore lack temporal validity because we would not yield the same results if we were to do the same experiment again now. There are a few more types of validity but um, we won't cover them until year two um, so we can get started on looking at reliability and what reliability means. Reliability refers to how much we can depend on any method to be consistent. So it's about the consistency of a method that we use to measure something. So can the research be replicated and the same results be found? If we want to check the reliability of a set of results, um, usually the study or test is given to a group of people on more than one occasion. Um, so that would be maybe giving um, a a group of participants um, uh, an experiment to sit um, and then maybe a few weeks or a few days later they do the experiment or the test again and if you get the same scores or similar results then the experiment could be deemed reliable. So I'm going to put this in a bit of context for you. Um, if you have a set of scales at home and within one hour you step on the scales every 10 minutes um, and you are the same weight each time, that would suggest that your scales are reliable. But if you do the same thing, so within every 10 minutes of an hour, you step on the scales and it gives you completely different results, unless you are eating maybe tons of donuts, that would suggest that your scales were not reliable. So it's the same with an experiment. If we have the same results or get the same set of results consistently, that suggests that our results or our experiment is reliable. So we've looked at research methods that use the experimental method now, um, and we are going to have a look at non-experimental research methods. Um, so at this point, you can pause it, have a toilet break, go and get something to eat, it's up to you, or you can continue working through um, onto the last section. So the last section for today is an example of a non-experimental method, and we're going to be looking at observations. So this is a study that only uses observational techniques as opposed to a study that uses them to measure one of the variables. So we're going to go through the types of observations. Um, in lessons, you're going to evaluate the types of observations in more depth. Um, but today's lesson will just be so you can understand the types of observations that exist in psychology. So let's have a look at the first set. So the first one we have here is a naturalistic experiment. This is when an observation takes place in an everyday setting in which the investigator does not interfere and merely observes the behaviour in question. So if we were looking at playing behaviour in children and we observed them in their own setting, so at home, playing with their mum um, in their front room, that would be an example of a naturalistic observation because we are observing the children in their everyday setting. On the other hand, you could do a controlled observation. 
So this is when the behaviour is observed, but under conditions where certain variables have been kind of organised by the researcher. So this could be in maybe a lab where you were observing participants through a two-way mirror or observing them um, kind of in a highly controlled setting that you have set up um, as the observer. Right, another type of observation is an overt observation. So this is when the participants are aware that their behaviour is being studied. Um, so previous to this, we looked at a controlled observation and in a controlled observation, it's highly likely that the participants will know that they are being studied or observed. So um, it can be that an observation is both controlled and overt. Another problem with participants being aware that their behaviour is being studied is that it could lead to demand characteristics. So the participants could potentially change their behaviour um, to suit the, um, the observer and to kind of go along with the aim of the observation. Another observation type is a covert observation. So this is when the observation is kept secret and the participants are not aware that they are being observed. So often the observer is undercover and they are observing the participants without their knowledge. Right, the last types of observation are participant observation and non-participant observation. So a participant observation is when the observations are being made by someone who is also participating in the activity being observed. So if I asked you guys to go to your sixth form common room and observe the behaviour um, of your, um, your peers, you could easily be a participant observer and conduct a participant observation because you could be part of the activity being observed. A non-participant observation is when the observer is separate from the people being observed. Again, a problem with participant observations are that it's quite hard to um, remain objective if you are part of the group in the first place. So it could lead to maybe some sort of bias in your observation. So, how do we conduct an observation in psychology? Well, we could possibly use uh, or do an unstructured observation, which is where there is no system to our observation at all. Um, so, we could go into the playground and just look at all the behaviours and um, make note of them or retain the information in our heads. It's really unusual to do an observation like this, but we could possibly do an unstructured observation as a pilot study before we go ahead and do a structured observation. So in a structured observation, we have a rigid structure to our observations. And the main way we do this is by using something called behavioural categories and sampling procedures. If I wanted to do an observation to look into aggressive behaviour in the playground, I must first think about the behavioural categories I would need. So this is why it might be quite useful um, to do a or an unstructured inter um, observation before we do a structured observation so we can get an idea of the behavioural categories we would like to use in our observation. So here for the observation or in aggressive kind of on aggressive behaviour in the playground, I have chosen punching, swearing, kicking and shouting as my behavioural categories. Every time I observed one of these behaviours, I can tally it off on my chart. However, the one thing I need to be careful of and make sure that I do is I need to make sure that the behavioural categories are objective they are mutually exclusive and cover all possible component behaviours. They need to be operationalised, so they need to be measurable. Now, if I was doing my observation and someone swore and shouted at the same time, 
I might be a little bit con confused as the observer and unsure of which category I should tally. Would I tally both? Um, do I tally just one? Also, if another behaviour occurred that I didn't have as my behavioural category, um, I might be quite confused and worried and it might stop me from kind of observing accurately. Um, so as a result, you need to really take care when you are considering your behavioural categories and that's why an unstructured observation may be quite useful as a pilot study to decide what, um, what behavioural categories you're going to use when you do your structured observation. Another thing we need to consider is which behaviours we are going to observe. So what I mean by this is, do we watch the whole of playtime, so a whole hour, or will there just be too much data to record? Um, and do we need to maybe decide on particular times during the hour that we will observe the um, children in the playground? Now, this is when we think about the different sampling procedures we can use. So, we can either use event sampling. So, event sampling is when you count the number of times an event occurs. So, each time the behaviours that we've decided we want to record in our um, kind of as our behavioural categories, every time they occur in that whole hour, we have to record them. However, with time sampling, this is when we make a decision that we are only going to observe maybe the first 10 minutes or the last 10 minutes of playtime and then record all the behaviours in our behaviour as our behavioural categories within that time frame. The main thing that affects observations in psychology is something called observer bias. So how can we actually be sure that the observer is being objective and hasn't let their own expectations affect the result? Right, so once we conduct the observation, we need to make sure that our observation is actually reliable. So what we do is we get a second observer who also conducts the structured observations using the behavioural categories. So they have the same behavioural categories as us and they kind of tally in exactly the same way. If the second observer gets the same or similar results once compared as a correlation, that means our results are reliable and in your homework booklet um, for this particular task, I have included a really good flowchart to show you how we conduct structured observations in psychology. So when you're answering your questions for this week, it's really important that you have a look at this um, and use it to actually help you answer the questions. Um, make sure you understand everything that's on that flowchart. If there's anything you do not understand, please make sure you let me know um, and we can give you a hand during the lesson.